Greetings everybody. I want to just do a kind of impromptu video from where I am here in the north of Scotland. I think the thing I want to say is really no different to what I've been saying and we've been saying for the last number of years regarding the priority that the church must give to repentance. When we see things going on in Israel that are difficult to watch and concerning, but also in a weird way encouraging because we know that there are things that must happen in and around Israel, focusing ultimately on the city of Jerusalem. We know that these things must happen before Jesus' foot eventually touches the Mount of Olives. So in a sense, it's bittersweet. It's bitter because of the suffering and of the, the trauma, but it's sweet because we know that day by day, our redemption is drawing nigh. Now, there are lots of buzzwords floating around in the secular media, probably even in the Christian response to what we're seeing in Israel. The word unprecedented is the main buzzword, of course, but the, the bit of language that I heard just this morning that caught my attention was a phrase that a Middle Eastern security expert used regarding this, which was when he said that this is the beginning of a new chapter, the beginning of a new chapter. Now, of course, there are security experts, there are experts on Middle Eastern conflicts, there are experts in all these different nuanced ways that people like me and you most likely don't have any clue about at all. But when it comes to trying to imagine what it must be like looking into this situation without a biblical worldview, it must be it must be bewildering to not have a biblical worldview, both about the history of Israel, the covenant people of God, I mean, as well as the more recent nation, um, as well as the eventual eschatological unfolding that will happen, whether or not in our lifetime. And I, this beginning of a new chapter, the phrase struck me because, as I said earlier, in one sense, nothing has changed because the call to repentance remains the same. It's not a call to repentance now just because there's been this unprecedented beginning of a new chapter in the conflict between Israel and Palestine, but it's a new chapter, I believe, because of an intensification in the preparation of the people of God, the covenant people of God, to prepare. And when I heard the phrase at the beginning of a new chapter, I, understand, I hear that and understand that to mean that it's the beginning of a new opportunity to prepare. And I'm in conversations at the minute with some guys in well-known ministries in America that have been teaching and talking about the Lord's return for two or three decades, if not more, and have been teaching various different generations about the need to be forerunners. And I want to just simply say this. If we are going to take seriously, and it remains a question of if, if we are going to take seriously the Lord's return and what we know will happen before that, the travail and the tribulation, the mass apostasy, the love of most growing cold, Matthew 24, it's important to understand that there are certain doctrinal issues within the church that are going to clarify. Historic differences between denominations, between cessationists and charismatics, between egalitarians and complementarians, and this, and this notion of agreeing to disagree, which if you press stop, and pause and think about it, doesn't make sense. Does God, thinking of God and his dealings with Israel, let alone the church, does God operate on the level of, let's agree to disagree on this, c'est la vie? Of course he doesn't. God never negotiates with idolatry. And so I want to just simply say that the beginning of this new chapter, whether that is just in the geopolitical world or whether there are spiritual um, consequences and implications as well, I think there probably are. And if we take it that there are 
spiritual implications to what is a new chapter geopolitically, I would say this is that don't expect the church to be prepared to not be swept away into the lukewarmness and the coldness of the love of most growing cold. Don't expect that not to happen to you if you're not willing to have your theological doctrinal convictions challenged and ultimately clarified. I think that's what is the most pressing, you could argue the most pressing need on the whole planet, is that doctrinal theological areas of agree to disagree are clarified and that there is a new clarity to what it means to be a Christian. It will be immense travail and turbulence. It will be frightening. It's going to require that level of seismic activity for the church to wake up to what I've just said, which is that there has to be clarity on these issues that we tend to think aren't that important. When the Lord, when John the Baptist and the Lord himself came proclaiming the gospel, repent for the kingdom of God is near, the repentance means everything is on the table. And I would just say simply that when we pray Maranatha, Lord come, our Lord come, what we're praying is, Lord, would you come and hasten those things that must happen before you come? But that the prayer is also that the church would be able to bow the knee in genuine historic repentance so that doctrinal theological areas that reflect directly on who we say God is in our testimony of knowing the person of God, the Trinity, has to be clarified. It has to be clarified. And that's not to say that every little bump is ironed out to the, but I'm talking about the major things. And let me just tell you what I think the major issues are. It's on the homosexual issue. It's on the gender disaster and the issues surrounding that. It's on therefore marriage, but also I would say this, and I've said this before and I say it again even more strongly and with more conviction, is that this issue of egalitarianism, of disagreeing that the Bible says that male leadership is the only way forward for spiritual authority in the church, the church that will be prepared for the end of the age, by the way, egalitarianism that revises that, that acquiesces to cultural pop norms on that, and yet, as I've done a video on very recently, f utterly fails to provide any scriptural basis for that that makes any sense, let alone that begins to even verge on being convincing. If we're going to seriously revise what the New Testament says at the most plain basic, any boy in England driving a plough can understand type level, if we're going to revise these things in the New Testament regarding the church and at the same time not provide any information about how that would be even possible whilst talking about national radical repentance we are deluded we are deluded radical repentance in the church if a big, at the beginning of a new chapter if that's what it is spiritually to reflect the geopolitics of the world has to include radical repentance where everything every doctrine every theology is on the table and as I've said before, even if I'm wrong about any issue, which obviously I don't think I am because my heart is to be true, not right, so even if I'm disagreeing with everybody, but even if I'm wrong on any one issue, I should still be able to call the church to repentance because 50% of the church are wrong and grieving the Holy Spirit. Therefore, so should you.